This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. received a surprise visit from an unexpected cat. I haven't been actually able to see much of his face, but I have a suspicion this is Shasha. And it seems like he got lucky making a kill sometime during the day. He's managed to put a big female impala up a tree. And he's busy chewing it on a marula tree. Just after we were saying and wishing that hopefully we would be able to see him before the end of our stint, because I really like him as a leopard. It's pretty cool. And he's um, doing all sorts of balancing up there. It must have been quite an effort to put uh, to put the impala up there. But obviously, if it if it is him, then we can say Simbuyi, his mom, has taught him well as to what to do to get kills out of out of the ground and out of reach of hyenas. As we know, the hyena population on Juma is is quite a strong one with the clan being fairly large and putting pressure on animals such as the leopards when they make kills and so on so it's pretty cool to be able to catch up with him i suspect this is what the vast majority of the animals are doing they're feeding or they're eating on something because when we have big storms like what we did yesterday it's really good hunting opportunities for them so happy to see that one of the young males actually managed to get something which is quite impressive He's just, he's still, it seems, he doesn't seem like he's eaten a lot. I don't know from the other side, because um, we didn't find him. One of the other Juma vehicles found him. Um, it seems, I don't know if he has managed to open the, the, the stomach or if he's just fed on the back a little bit, which could also be, um, could be the, the option. Very cool. I haven't seen a leopard with a kill up a tree for a while now. Huh. Very exciting times to spend an afternoon and also to find a cat that is not asleep. Always works out. Now, all we have to do is wonder where Darkmane actually is, because I wouldn't be surprised that he pops out here somewhere if he were to be close by. Oh, that Darkmane can be a scavenger. And he's also quite something. But a lot of different animals like dark mane and the hyenas, they would likely hear the crunching of the bones. Now that it's a little bit cooler, the sound also travels further. So it, although he's got the kill up there, other animals might be warned or might find out that he's got a kill here. So something like Molowati, perhaps, if he were to come here, maybe he would try his luck and steal the kill from him. Dark mane really wanted to. I suppose he could even climb that tree, although I feel like that's a bit of a high and tall tree for him. But it's... I've seen lions climb trees before. Maybe not such tall trees, but they've tried. I don't think he's wedged this impala the best possible way, but I do think that um, it's a bit of a tricky one. And if he's not careful, he might drop it, and in which case, if he drops it, then he's going to have to put it all the way back up. And he's feeding quite quickly. I don't know, maybe he he's trying to get all of everything out of the way, trying to feed as much as possible. Look at that tail going and flicking. Okay. Ooh, ooh. She you know, it is quite amazing the way that they carry and move the kills up in the trees. And, but I don't 
think I'm a little bit concerned because I don't think he's wedged it properly. And I mean, he's got his weight on part of the stomach, so he's holding it in there, or not the stomach, or sort of the back. But if he's not careful, he might just drop it, which means that he'll have to put it all the way up there. So I'm not sure. Does he even have the back legs? It's a bit of contrast that we're seeing. We'll try to reposition the vehicle. Oh no, the legs are there, but they're bent. I'm not sure what, you know, why he thinks this was the best way to put it up there. Maybe there was a pressure from another predator and that's why he's decided to put it up here. Maybe he got really excited that he got an entire impala for himself. But I think maybe what we're going to try to do is then eventually go around and see if we can get a view from the other side just to see what the condition of the carcass is. Maybe if we can get the sun not to be just behind us, maybe we'll get a bit of a better look. He's quite it's quite funny the way that he's there because he's not on the biggest branch and he's just decided to put this impala in a branch that doesn't look the sturdiest so it's quite funny but i'm very happy he got a kill because i know when lauren and you well, when wasn't it when you guys you were with her you guys had him the other day he was trying to hunt and i think he just missed something at the dam wall and then obviously yesterday wherever it is that he went he didn't catch anything because uh the skill looks pretty fresh i'm pretty sure that it was made sometime today doesn't seem like he's eaten a lot of it and just also judging by his stomach and the flanks of his sides I don't think he's eaten too much hey. he's almost like furiously trying to to open it up I think maybe let me try to reposition see if we can get a different angle and maybe we'll be able to see better what's what's happening or how much of it he's actually eaten does that work going um, now that we've managed to come and angle our view a little bit more, we can see that he actually hasn't, he's just taken the stomach out and I think it fell on the ground a couple of moments ago because we just heard this very loud thump. So I think he's actually gotten lucky and he's made the kill sometime during the day. Because Owen and I were giggling, we were saying earlier, like, no, we drove this road this morning. How did we miss a leopard on a tree? But I don't think we missed it, thankfully. I don't think he was here, <laughs> judging by how much he's eaten and how much is up there. He's got a good kill there going, so if he doesn't drop it or if he doesn't put it in a funny way that is going to compromise the balance of the kill, then he will likely have a good meal for the next sort of two days or so. So he should be a happy cat. I see some, is that one of the organs there? I can't see if that's the skin or if he's maybe taken out the lungs or something else like that because there, there are a lot of nutrition, or there's a high nutritional value for the animals. They don't only just eat the meat. They'll eat the lungs, they'll eat the liver, they'll eat the heart. Um, just not the stomach because of course all of these organs have very important nutrients and enzymes that keep the animals healthy and not being able to feed on those particular organs is what sometimes causes um, some deficiencies or natural deficiencies in the in the animals that are kept in captivity so you'll see that animals are are kept in captivity a lot of the times you'll need to give them supplements for calcium phosphorus I think even zinc for uh, for some of them and it's because they don't get all of those nutrients from everything that they eat oh yeah that's definitely maybe just maybe it was another organ that fell because that seems to be the stomach what he's taken out there and he's eating quite desperately so I think it might be safe to assume that this kill was made sometime during during the afternoon the entire face is disappearing inside of the impala so if this is a little bit too much we suggest perhaps having a strong cup of tea because this is a happy leopard right here. It's a young male leopard that's still trying to find his way in life. And so far, I must say, it's doing well. It's impressive. I mean, he's a big male, but uh, an impala eel is still a very big creature. 
And he might also be lucky because with the amount of rain that we've had, then of course there might be a natural pan somewhere around here. So he won't have to walk too far to get water. He won't have to leave this because the biggest pan that is around here, I would say it's probably Treehouse Dam, but he won't have to walk that far if he just finds a little pan somewhere around here. He might get lucky. Oh. I don't know what fell earlier, maybe it was the heart. Maybe a big piece of meat because he's definitely, that that round thing that you see next to his face, that's his stomach. So he hasn't even pulled out the stomach contents. And it's quite amazing if you think about it because a lot of the times um, the leopards, particularly the females, they'll, will feed on the kill a little bit just as they make the kill. But often they will try to open the carcass and get the stomach out to lighten the load, especially if they want to put it up a tree. So the fact that he's put this entire impala even with the stomach that adds weight on top it's quite impressive if i could take you on safari all day and all night i would but unfortunately it's not always the best time to see the animals now in between safaris you can watch the wild earth channel with loads of extra shows if you have a connected television Apple TV or Roku Box, then download the Wild Earth app and if not, then just find it on the App Store on your phone. It has been a wonderful privilege to identify one of our key characters here at Penguin Beach, Pepper, with a very, very distinct facial patterning, as the name would suggest, very peppered and speckled belly. I'm really looking forward to seeing what this penguin does over the next few days and months. Because of those unique markings, it's going to be really, really cool to watch it as it moves around the penguin colony here at Stony Point. <laughs> oh, 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 what are you doing? Are you trying out for the ballet? Now it's an itchy bottom. Up we get. Mom's coming. Everybody's moving off. I am an outdoor photographer, a wildlife filmmaker, and a conservation storyteller. Penguin Beach is going to offer us this really unique opportunity to watch and pick up on the smallest of details in the penguins' lives. It's going to allow us the time to really get to know these penguins well, get to know their story, and get to interpret the little finer details and share that with you with a live TV show and get you to fall in love with penguins. I love being a cam up for Wild Earth. The animals coming right up close to you, especially like lions. Sometimes you get nervous, but you have to go with the flow. <laughs> My favorite animal to film is the elephant because of how big it is. But when it's really up close to you, it's one animal that you would say, I really respect you.
Isn't it wonderful to hear the fish alive again after they've been hiding from all the rain? Have you ever seen a hippo's tongue? <laughs> um, I've lost my train of thought. Play. Yes, I know it was play, but I'd, I had a point and I forgot it. I got distracted. I just, I find young hippos so funny. I can see you guys. Yeah, and it's through things like play fighting, for example, for young males and so on. When they, when uh, when they play fight, they build up their abilities and how to do that. And all young animals will do it. I mean, you'll see lions doing it. You'll see uh, leopard cubs climbing up trees. You'll see um, young elephants play fighting or putting up their trunks against one another and trying to push each other out of the way. So there, there's value in what they're doing, even if to us it doesn't seem like something particularly important. And it's just funny to watch them. They are building the skills that will hopefully help ensure their survival. I will right, later on. Um, Kevin, you were wondering if the hippos give birth in the water. They do. They give birth in the water. They mate in the water and they can also nurse their young ones underwater. So they are very well adapted to the semi-aquatic lifestyle. And I say semi-aquatic because they'll spend most of their time in the water. It's the area where they feel safe. But they come out of the water at night to look for food. So they actually need also the land the ones at the back are playing. This one's the, on the right. Like big hippos, they're play fighting now. <laughs> Although there's quite a size difference. I want to say these are probably two young boys. No offense to the young boys out there, but I don't think <laughs> the females will try to fight that way. <laughs> oh, getting serious now. to get a little bit more active the hippos now that the sun's going down. Nunary males in general of all the species tend to live slightly less than females so so generally hippos are believed to live until they're about 30 to 35 so the females will probably live a little bit longer more towards 35 and upwards and the males more towards 30. The reason for it is the males engage in a lot more fighting and a lot of more defending of territories than the females. The females in general tend to just do their own thing and they don't spend as much time fighting other creatures of the same species. So the males tend to live slightly less than the females. Same in the case of the hippos. A dominant bull will try to hold on to the, his power and the um, his territory or his pod for as long as possible without allowing or fight or while fighting off any other potential suitors that might try to take over his pod. It's a little one going out. Oh, you had us fooled. I thought that you were gonna go out. We just wanna see your tiny little legs, that is it. Well, for such a young creature, it's very agile in the water and clearly feels comfortable jumping up and down there. Shame, she's looking up like, oh, please help me. <laughs> it's 
quite a handful, this youngster. Samantha, I think that hippos um, are fully grown maybe when they're about six to eight years old, depending if it's a male or a female. So it takes, so they'll, they'll be sexually mature before then and they won't be under the care of the mother at that age, but it takes them quite a while to become adults. So this little one still has got a very long life ahead of it and a very long time before we can actually call it a, a fully grown hippo, either a male or a female. Okay. I thought it tried getting in t on top of the mom's back. Maybe it can't reach, it's jumping or bouncing off the bottom and then just trying to get on top of the mom, but it can't. <laughs> Trying a new angle. I think it's definitely trying to convince the mom of something. Something naughty. <laughs> Maybe it just wants to go on its mom's shoulders and the mother won't let it. <laughs> Look, it's definitely trying. It really wants to go on top of the mom's back. <laughs> and the mom's having none of it. It did it! It did it for a second! <laughs> Where did you guys disappear onto? just playing games, just jumping from on top of the mother from one side to the next. <laughs> it's actually very adorable. Yes! You did it! Yay! At long last! I wonder why it's keeping the nose in, in there. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> The mom's just like, no, I said no, I will not carry you. <gasps> but why? <laughs> Let's see if she stands back up just to make it slip down again. Oh, okay, she's been carrying it the whole day and she just doesn't feel like it anymore. <laughs> When on safari, there is nothing better than an evening spent under the stars chatting around a fire, with the sounds of the wild all around you. If you sign up to be a Wild Earth Explorer, you can build your own memories by joining our guides for regular fireside chats. Subscription payments can be made by PayPal, credit card, and now bank transfer. Wild Earth Explorers, it's in your nature. Clearly, something in the vicinity around you that's drawn their attention. Yes, that meerkat in the tree is just the coolest of cool meerkats. But watch out how, how bad he battles when he comes down. <laughs> it would be like me climbing a tree, just better. My favorite animal is a leopard, 
purely because I just think they are just the epitome of feline grace and power and the way they can move about in any environment and remain hidden until they want to be seen, I just find it incredibly intoxicating and they're amazingly beautiful. Catch up with the guides daily here on Wild Earth. It's a huge privilege to be in these incredible places with these amazing animals. I love forming lions. When they do get up and do something, it's always spectacular. When they are playing, they are incredibly fun to watch, especially sabots and cubs. I love being in the bush and working in these incredible places with these amazing animals. We want to bring it to you so that you can almost feel like you're right there and be able to experience it and enjoy it the way we are. Evelyn, you say you want to eat whatever this hippo has. Well, whatever it is, it will certainly make you hyper. <laughs> I thought for a second there when she opened its mouth that it was maybe going to try and jump on her mouth. That would have been quite funny, to be honest. <laughs> I must also be very slippery to try and get on top of the mother, because they are also slippery themselves. And with all that water, I don't think it's the, it's not attempting to do the easiest of things. We call a group of hippos a pod or a raft. Oh, I think mom's decided she, they're going, they're going. I wonder if she's gonna come into the island. Kind of nudging it in that direction. It's shallower there as you can see, because you can see more of the hippo. One of the little one, but I'm not sure what her plans are right now. Maybe she's just like, fine, we'll play around here for a little bit. You're being a handful. Or maybe this is a timeout area. I'm not sure yet. Oh, this is a lovely little pan, actually. I just want to take a look at it. It's a pan that I often forget about. It was very close to the Mowati as well, which makes it quite accessible for animals. But if you look, there's quite a film of algae. And algae blooms for lots of reasons, probably lots of nutrients in there from animals defecating. Elephants, rhinos, hyenas, put pumps sort of extra nutrients into the water and it's very stagnant. Other than the rains last night, there's sort of no inflow, no outflow. It's just a really stagnant water body. And once the oxygen gets removed, well, it looks like this. I'm just gonna sit for a moment or two. There's some wonderful sounds around us right now.
isn't it lovely to just stop for a moment? We've done a lot of driving. It was nice just to take a break. The Battle Royale ended rather abruptly with the two original hosts disappearing with the interloper now inside their home. So we decided to move on from the domestic dispute. A very interesting arthropod. There's going to be plenty of them this morning. I hope you're ready for creepy crawlies. This is a zebra millipede. And I think you'll understand quite easily why it's called that. Hi everyone, my name is Mike Anderson, behind the camera is Craig, and we are here once again at Eco Training's Pride Lands Conservancy, where after a very heavy rainstorm last night and lots of thunder, it was an awesome display of nature's firepower. It was consistently powerful for about an hour, which was incredible. And that kind of rainstorm and this nice warm, humid weather is what is bringing all these insects out. Now they realize that summer has started the wet, rain, lots of soft food, soft dead vegetation. So this millipede that we see here, very, very defensive, but I think it will uncurl itself soon. Here we go. It's just starting to very slowly uncurl. This millipede is a herbivore. And in fact, most, most often termed a detritivore, feeding on dead plant material. So especially after the rain here, the dead plant material is nice and soft. Oh, look at it. Here it uncurls. Beautiful colors. So it curls up like that to defend its very sensitive legs. So it's got hundreds of legs. I think it's probably got hundreds of legs. Oh, look at that. Straight as it uncurls, straight onto a nice, soft impala dung pellet. Had a little nibble. No, that one was not tasty. It's going to keep moving. Look at those beautiful colors. So it curls up to protect its legs from damage from predators, which is assumed we were. And now as it moves, it has other types of defense as well. It can, it can actually secrete toxic substance. Oh, look, it's defecating. That's interesting. Look at the back of its body. It just opens this um, very mechanical looking flap and then drops a tiny little pellet. That's interesting. I've never seen that before. So they can, can secrete a toxic substance from between the segments on their body, which is one defense. It can also turn upside down and move very much like a snake. And I think I've heard that called swearing. I mean, by doing that, by turning upside down and moving like a snake, a small predator might be surprised and think, oh, it's not what I thought it was. Or it's even possible that it could shake off any small insect predators like assassin bugs by doing that. Perhaps give itself just a few moments to escape towards a thick bundle of grass like this one is doing now. Oh, touched something that did not like. The ferret that is easy to find out. I'd actually, I've never measured my hands before, but this one is about as long as from the end of my index finger to the corner of my thumb. So that long. That is how long this millipede is. So what is that? Maybe 15 centimeters? No, a little bit. Yeah, around about 15 centimeters, maybe, maybe a bit less. Very, very nerve, nervous millipede, though. It's probably the first day that it's gone out since the last season. I don't think they live particularly long, but this one is quite large. I think it's probably more than one, one season old. And so it's very cautious about how it moves. You can see it's, see that? It, we weren't even anywhere near it, and it just touched something that it didn't recognize or didn't like, and it immediately curled up into a ball to protect itself. It's amazing how quick that is. There are many things that feed on this, from you know assassin bugs, like I mentioned, that will pierce through the the segments on its body with these little stabbing mouth parts, to things like civets. Civet, civets will also consume millipedes. Actually, lots of them. They seem unaffected by the toxins in the millipede's body. Those cyanide 
phase secretions that I spoke about earlier that they can secrete from between the segments. But I've also heard hornbills use these millipedes. They collect them and they actually disturb them and press them all around their nests. And they secrete this toxin, which then uh, gets rid of any parasites from the nesting sites that the hornbills like to use. That's quite clever. You ever heard of, of, a, of a, a bird using an insect repellent? I don't think it's very pleasant for the millipede, unfortunately. I think it possibly even dies in the process, but nature is nature. As a naturalist, it's really important that I stay up to date and up to breast with what's happening in the wild and in the world around us. The Wild Earth app helps us do that and helps us stay abreast with the live interactions of animals every day. We're going to be here at Stony Point bringing you the African penguin story and we'd love to see you on the app. See you on the beach. Cape Nature is the chief custodian of the Western Cape of South Africa's natural environment. This highly successful organization strives to conserve the province's natural heritage to ensure a sustainable future. Besides nurturing nature, Cape Nature offers an authentic ecotourism experience to local and international visitors. And one of these experiences is walking amongst the penguins at Stony Point, or as we know it, Penguin Beach. Wild Earth broadcasts live from here every day and is very privileged to be partnered with Cape Nature who have focused their conservation efforts here. If you want to visit these iconic black and white African penguins for yourself, then head over to our website to find out more. Cape Nature. Conserve. Explore. Experience. So there we go, there we go. Look. All three in one frame. <laughs> Look at that. Isn't that cool? Oh, that is so special. That is exactly what we had been hoping for is all three of them to come together and make the perfect little family portrait. My name is David and I love being a cam op because you get a front row seat to all the best sightings that Wild Earth has to offer. Sharing it with everyone else, well that's a perk too. What makes the Wild Earth experience magical? Well, it has to be the fact that it's live and interactive. The sighting that'll be ingrained in my brain for life, watching a lioness kill three wildebeest during the migration in the space of about 20 minutes. My spirit animal, that has to be a monkey. Good morning everyone. Welcome to a very wet, to my private game reserve. We have spotted our first animal of today and it happens to be one of the best in the entire ecosystem. That's the termites, macro termites and that's the soldiers, just protecting their mound in case any threat comes by. Naturally, we've got our rain roof on because it has been raining, thunder and lightning, but we're out and about. My name is Lauren and I do have Davi on camera and now we are on Rusty. I feel like introducing the cars these days is very, very important. We're on the good car. That's a good one. I think we may be in store for a little bit more rain, but we're just going to see what happens. A drizzle we can handle, a downpour we cannot, and of course lightning is way out of our league. But for now, we are going to try and bumble. We've got termites. I'm going to head to the hyena den, and I do have two dead insects in my car for you all. They died of natural causes, but they give us a really good chance to get real nice close-ups of the anatomy and the exoskeleton. So as we look at these termites, I just want to remind you all that we're live, finally, and interactive. So please do talk to us. That's what we're all about. You can send in your questions using the hashtag WildEarth on Twitter or on the Wild Earth website where you need to have registered and you can submit your questions under the live safari page. Kids, if you're watching, please do send in your questions. They're very often the best. You send them in via email and the email address is kidsquestions at wildearth.tv. Now, it's a little bit tricky to see what's going on in here, but you just see inside the hole, there is movement, and that's the soldiers. 
not all termites are the same cast, we call that. They're different. And these are the guys that are going to defend, protect, and do everything they can for their termite mound and for their colony. But they're hiding. It's not often you see termites. Sometimes they're hard at work. They're busy 24-7. But sometimes they're hard at work inside of the mound. You don't always see them on the outside, and naturally they're going to make most of the rain. Moist soil is exactly what they need to build and build and build. And of course they're going to build. They need to construct their mound, increase their colony. It's all about the collective, and that's the absolute beauty of termites. And of course you get the reproductives, the kings and the queens. You get the soldiers, which we're looking at right now, where we were, and then you get the workers. And they're all completely different. But their aim, their goal in life is for the collective. The collective of the colony. The Soul of the White Anne, I ref reference that book all the time because it's so fantastic and you can get it for free online, a PDF. And they describe a termite colony as a super organism. A living, breathing, working collective. Okay, so we're going to sit here and just enjoy watching these termites a little bit longer. They were clear for now, but I think they cut out every now and then. Watching termites, one of my favorite, favorite insects, although I say that about them all because I really adore them all. But you can just see in the mound we have the soldiers working away just on the periphery there getting ready to defend if anything comes by to it oh, hear that thunder mm. i think we are in store for a bigger downpour but let's just sit here for a moment or two and listen to the thunder
Now, I mentioned this the other day, but I'm just going to touch on it again because I think a lot of people will think, what do you mean, super organism? What? What are you talking about? Well, it's not my description. That's just the way the termites are described. And what it means is that termites basically live in societies where the collective power of the colony far, far outstrips that of the individual. It's not a selfish individual goal, as with most organisms across the planet. Even being in a herd, even if you're in a, an impala, that's the collective of the herd is actually quite selfish. You're trying to dilute your presence. You're trying to hide in amongst the others so that you will not be the one chosen by the predator. It's not like that for termites. And it, being part of the superorganism is the termite superpower. I'm a firm believer Every single animal has a superpower. You've just got to tap into it and learn what that is. I also believe each individual human has a superpower, but that's a whole different topic. And it's like being part of a construction site without a foreman. No termite is in charge of the project. No one is reporting to the alpha. No one's reporting to the matriarch. No one is reporting to any leader. And what's amazing is it's almost like there is a collective plan encoded in the collective mind of the colony. It's like their DNA blueprint, and they're all just working for the same goal. No one is the boss. Everybody has their role or their caste, and that means that means different jobs and different physical features. Now the birds are wakening up because it's been raining. Firefins, you're asking about their food. Termites' food basically comes from cellulose. And cellulose is that material in plants that we talk about that's really, really hard to break down, and that's why you get herbivores that ruminate, etc. And Cellulose is actually a polymer. It's really tough and it's really resilient. It's a compound, a polymer compound. It's really resilient in plants and that's why it is so tough to break down. Humans really are not good at breaking down cellulose. And it's essentially sugar. It's made up of sugar. But termites don't produce cellulase and cellulase is the enzyme that breaks down cellulose. So there's different species of termites that actually sort of feed in different ways. But generally, termites rely on microorganisms that live as part of their digestive system, just like ruminants. The microorganisms are the ones that are breaking down the cellulose. It's basically just bacteria, like your good bacteria. We also have bacteria in our gut. And it's a symbiotic relationship, the termites and the microorganisms. But termites also have a wonderful relationship with fungi. And that's the food that they need. That's the food that they need to feed the microorganisms. They're not eating the termites. It's a wonderful, complex relationship. But we're going to bumble on, and as we do that, let's take a look at the weather. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Buffalsuk Cutline. I had some reports of the wild dogs coming south towards this cutline, so they are still following them. So we are actually just standing by and waiting. 
where exactly they're going to cross, I'm not sure, but I think as they get closer to the property, they'll let us know. So good morning, you are with me, Rowan. Behind the camera, I've got Odie, and I'm just listening to the radio. Sorry about this morning, I had quite a large lightning storm that crossed over us, and then quite a bit of rain, so I had to wait it out just a tiny bit so both of us have our roofs on. And yeah, we are out and about. It looks rather light, like the rain should hold off. By the way, I can imagine the, the wild dogs, still the Hamilton pack, still 26 of them. That'd be quite exciting to see. But we haven't checked further down the cut line, so I can't really tell you what have, what's crossed in or out. Might go for a quick, short little walk later. Just two minutes check around here. <laughs> Anna Marie, very excited that we are live. We are indeed Anna Marie. We are out and about and live. Yeah, still no dogs that way. Lara Moore, I like that you like the clouds. They are. It looks very, very dark in the west. You guys are facing east now. Oh. It almost, uh, I don't want to call it, but I think we might be in the clear. No, maybe I'm going to join you a little bit later. I'd like to check our boundary if there is no Ghana coming in our property first. Okay. So that's good news for Nauti's out. And he is just checking the boundaries, basically what we're doing, to see if any lions have come in. Leading straight south, no sure don't. Um, so they'll be in Juma probably shortly. That's also good news. And dogs are coming straight south, so they should be in Juma shortly. So we'll just wait it out. Okay, it seems like Lauren has a bit of a surprise for you guys. So we're gonna send you back over to her while we just carry on waiting here. We haven't actually moved because there's something very dark down there, and that's why the that's where the hyena den is. Uh, I don't want to move. So I did tell you that I had two insects. Well, that's a bit loose. But first, we're going to start with number one. This is a praying mantis. Died of natural causes, I found it in a sink. And I go around camp looking for dead insects. And as sad as it is, it does give us an opportunity to sort of really dive into the anatomy of this thing. It's a, uh, there, there are different species of praying mantis, and I'm just gonna turn this a little bit more. You can see this one camouflages itself, almost like a stick or a piece of debris. It is not a stick insect. It is 100% a praying mantis. And what gives that away is two things. The eyes, the very obvious triangular shaped eyes. I'm just gonna turn them around. He's very fragile. And the front legs. Now all insects have six legs. Unfortunately, this little guy has lost a leg, but that's okay. He should have six. And what I feel most people don't recognize within insects is that just as in other animals, the central nervous system, in conjunction with hormones actually, 
is responsible for regulating all the physiological processes. A lot of people don't think that insects have any sort of central nervous system or hormones like we do. Okay, it's not the same as ours, but they do have hormones. That's exactly what regulates their molting process. It's all under hormonal control. They do have nerves. They do have nerve centers. And I think a lot of people maybe sometimes forget that, but we're just gonna do a bit of anatomy here because every insect basically has the same body structure, the same anatomy. I'm not talking about spiders here. They are arachnids, but it's just different. So for example, here is the head. The head must consist of all the nerve centers tiny little head, the eyes, which are huge and very detailed on a praying mantis, and the antenna. Now, he has got two antenna, the other one's just stuck. I don't know how long he's been dead for. And the antenna are, of course, sensory organs. So this is the information center, if you like, where everything is processed, just like ours. We have a head, that's where our eyes are, that's where our brain is. We just sadly don't have antenna, but I would really love to have antenna. Now, I'm just gonna turn them around and you'll see, just like other insects, there's a thorax. Now, praying mantises rely on ambush, they rely on camouflage, but they do have wings. And here you see folded down his body are a pair of wings. They can fly. They just look really bizarre when they fly because that's not their primary defense mechanism. They can escape predators with flight, they're just not great at it. So what Davi's shown you here, right in the middle, is the attachment site with lots of muscles for the two wings. But it's also the attachment site for all six legs. The legs are all attached to the thorax, and that is because the thorax... No! I'm trying to be delicate with them, but yeah. The thorax is a transport center and it's elongated in praying mantises. So you see, even though there's a pair of legs here, the four legs, and the rest of the legs are here, it's still the thorax. Everything that allows the insect mode of transport, be it wings, be it those elongated, enlarged hind legs of grasshoppers, are all part of the thorax. But in praying mantises, it's just really elongated. It doesn't have to be the same shape or size in each insect. I'm gonna turn them over. And in this last part, that's hidden under the wings, but it's not where the wings are attached to. There we go, there's, oh, look, okay. Wow. Would you look at that, Davi? It's because he got wet. Isn't that stunning? That's the wings. So just like all insects, they've got four wings. So these are the, the second wings, the second set, which is really beautiful. And then, sorry, this is a bit sort of <laughs> delicate. This is the top wing that are slightly harder. So just like a dragonfly, a butterfly, there are four wings. This one sits on the other one. The four wings sit on the hind wing. And it's complicated because you've got four F-O-U-R and then you've got four F-O-R-E. But anyway, and... The wings are not attached to the abdomen, but they sit on top of the abdomen. So just here now, you see this elongated, long stretch of body. This is the abdomen. And this is where you will find all the reproductive organs and the digestive organs. The reproductive organs naturally are at the base of this praying mantis. So sometimes, although it's sad to see dead insect, it also gives us a great chance to dive into their biology and anatomy. Sandy, you're asking, do the bodies decompose? Yes, of course. All living things decompose. Now, naturally, skeletons and bone, they do actually decompose, but over a long, long period of time. But yes, they absolutely do biodegrade and decompose and become part of the living ecosystem. A hundred percent. It may take time for the tougher parts, but the softer parts, absolutely. Now, Davi, just here, the front legs. In praying mantises, this is their superpower. They use their front legs as their sort of punching, grabbing, seizing, 
this is the power you can see that they're slightly different from the other legs that we showed you and if you look they've got very very sharp hooks here this is so that they can cling on to vegetation they've also got sensory hairs and it's also larger so just to give you an example maybe i'll do it here just like a mantis shrimp actually which is one of the most powerful fastest punches in the entire animal kingdom they normally hold their front legs up like this so the back four legs are for walking and balance but these legs are normally up like this and it's ready for battle even the flower mantis keeps these legs so as soon as the prey comes snatch but here this guy's trying to look like a stick so very often he'll stretch out his legs like this to become part of the illusion that he is a stick and it's absolutely remarkable. So the superpowers for our prey mantis comes in the front legs. So even though this guy here looks different from a flower mantis or maybe any of the other color mantises that we get out here, it's the same, it's the same body shape and it's the same superpower if we just look here that is in the front two legs. So I hope you all enjoyed that. I would much prefer it if he was alive, but naturally he's not. Megan Edwards, good morning. You're seeing fascinating stuff there. Yes, sir. Indeed. I, I spend all my days looking for dead insects, looking for insects and trees that I can show you on drive. And naturally, a fascinating structure. Sorry, but it's also fascinating stuff there. I can hear my voice really loud in the comms. <laughs> um, absolutely fascinating but it is the same and that's the point that i sort of wanted to get over insect physiology is very different from that of vertebrates and you've got to understand the basic physiology first before you can start to go into the more complicated physiology and then the behavior and this is the basic basic body structure of an insect uh, yes an insect you have the head the thorax and the abdomen information center transport center digestive and reproductive center. And once you start to break it down into its really simple parts, then you can start to understand how an insect lives. I think that was wrong comms there. So yes, once you learn the basic structure, then you can go into the more complex structure. Then you can really go into the behavior of the animal and understand how it behaves due to its basic physiology. And prey and mantises are great examples of that. I do have another slightly more terrifying exoskeleton for you, but I'm going to leave that for a little while. But it's definitely not as cute, shall we say, as the praying mantis. Okay, I'm gonna sit and get my next exoskeleton ready for you all and we're gonna send you over to Rowan. Okay, so we've zoomed in a little bit and if you look at the top of the first, no, actually second crest, we can see the pack of wild dogs which as soon as we get Wendy starting again, we'll head straight in that direction. It's a lot of dogs here, and how nice of them to come straight towards us. Even though that's probably a kilometer away, which are coming straight down the boundary. Isn't that lovely? And now the direction they're looking in is into Juma, Actually, you can see a few of them have actually stopped and they're staring to their left. And from what I remember, it is quite thick there. I don't really see if they... I don't think they would go running in there. Otherwise, if they do, you know, it's not the end of the world. We'd be able to find them somehow. Just as Wendy starts going again, we'll make our way there. <laughs> That's actually such a cool view. It's just dogs everywhere, tails wagging. 
That's awesome. So I'm not sure if they've hunted already. Some of them starting to settle down. Some of them actually lying down. From this distance, I can't tell you which one's alpha female or alpha male. But it's usually when the alpha female starts walking that everyone will follow. But this is good news for us. Okay, so I can hear my soul coming to our rescue. So as soon as he gets here, we'll get Wendy going again and then head straight towards the pack. Shreyas, yay, dogs. I know, I know. Yes, and I've been waiting for them for two days already. Oh, it's good, they're settling. Okay. We'll get there. All the station coming. We'll get there very, very soon. It's amazing. Wow. Hey. And five, four, three, two, one. Live, live. Oh, that's cool. Just in there. And the black mamba's going up the tree and the mongoose is attacking it. Pounce again. <laughs> sure, you can all agree with me. It's not a bad start to our Wednesday morning. Something that I have never seen before in my entire life that you are now watching live. Look at that. It's just beautiful. Fantastic display by a little herd of springbuck. How is this view? My heart is in my mouth, everybody. Amazing, they've locked their tusks together. You can hear the cracking crunches. It is so incredible to spend this time so close to an African penguin, and it's completely unfazed by my presence whatsoever. How insane is that animal? Amazing. Fantastic to watch. Well, now we've got a tug of war between mom and daughter. Look. I'm just at a loss for words. I mean, that's just incredible to see that. Something's definitely rolling and I love it though. I love it when you can just sit and watch it. I'm not sure we're going to go too far from camp today. We're still in quarantine. Now before we show you what I have next, I don't know if any of you are Harry Potter fans, but in Harry Potter, Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire, 
I think it's Professor Moody takes out a spider from a jar and shouts, Imperio! <laughs> and basically this spider comes out the jar and proceeds to do acrobats and dance and do things that a spider would just not do. Davi's laughing at me. Have you seen Harry Potter? Okay, good. Just checking. And it's basically portrayed as this extremely venomous creature that's going to kill with one bite. But what was it? It wasn't actually a spider. What Professor Moody took out was not technically a spider, although it did have eight legs. It was known as a whip spider. Some people call it a tailless scorpion. And that is what I have for you, everyone. But it is dead. Okay, do not worry. Here, we have a whip scorpion spider. Now, I know some people are going to go, oh. And yes, that's also sort of how I feel, but it's remarkable because we now can get deep into these animals that I don't know if we've ever had one on drive. Have you ever filmed one, Dobby? I think so. Oh, okay. Well, that's disappointing. But they're not something that we film often. We see them around camp, but we don't actually get to film them on drive. And they're terrifying. They're absolutely terrifying. Luckily, here in South Africa, they're small. The ones that I had in the Amazon were absolutely ginormous. They were... Ugh, let's not talk about them. And it's not technically a spider, and it's also not technically a scorpion. It sort of sits in the middle. It's an arachnid. And they belong to an order, a special order, called Amblypygi or Amblypigli. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. But basically, the first part, Ambly, means blunt, and the second part, which I think is Pygi, means rump. So what it's shown you is just the absence of a tail. A tailless scorpion. So they're arachnids at the end of the day. And although they are utterly terrifying, they are not dangerous. Really, they don't have venom. They don't build webs. So they're not a scorpion. They're not a spider. But they are very intimidating all the same. So let's go through the body part. I hope you're all enjoying this. <laughs> they have two body parts. They're not classified as an insect, technically. So what they do have is the cephalothorax and the abdomen. So they have this part at the top, and then they also have a big, quite bulbous abdomen at the back there. Now, they do have eight legs. Six are for walking. One, two, three, four, five, six. And then look at this crazy long pair of legs here. Look at how out of proportion they are. And these really, really thin, extremely long front legs are actually for sensing. So just like the... Oh dear, just gonna do some cover. Sorry, Dobby, I just bombed your shot. I just need to cover up equipment here. That's the rain on. If it gets heavier, we will head back, but for now, we'll try and work with it. We just need to put paint covers on. Are you good, Dobby? Okay, yeah. <laughs> Bear with us. This is really heavy, guys. I think we're going to have to go back to camp. I'm afraid it's far too heavy to be out. Okay, everyone, we are going to race back to camp, but if it stops, as you know, we'll be back out again. So for now, we're going to send you into a repeat. Have you ever seen a hippo's tongue? <laughs> um, I've lost my train of thought. Play. Yes, I know it was play, but I'd, I had a point and I forgot it.
I got distracted. I just, I find young hippos so funny. I can see you guys. Yeah, and it's through things like play fighting, for example, for young males and so on. When they when uh, when they play fight they build up their abilities and how to do that and all young animals will do it i mean you'll see lions doing it you'll see uh, leopard cubs climbing up trees you'll see um, young elephants play fighting or putting up their trunks against one another and trying to push each other out of the way so there there's value in what they're doing even if to us it doesn't seem like something particularly important and it's just funny to watch them they are building the skills that will hopefully help ensure their survival I will right, later on. Um, Kevin, you were wondering if the hippos give birth in the water. They do. They give birth in the water. They mate in the water, and they can also nurse their young ones underwater. So they are very well adapted to the semi-aquatic lifestyle, and I say semi-aquatic because they'll spend most of their time in the water. It's the area where they feel safe, but they come out of the water at night to look for food. So they actually need also the land ones at the back are playing. This one's the, on the right. Like big hippos. They're play fighting now. <laughs> Although there's quite a size difference. I want to say these are probably two young boys. No offense to the young boys out there, but I don't think <laughs> the females will try to fight that way. <laughs> oh, getting serious now. to get a little bit more active the hippos now that the sun's going down. Munary males in general of all the species tend to live slightly less than females so so generally hippos are believed to live until they're about 30 to 35 so the females will probably live a little bit longer more towards 35 and upwards and the males more towards 30. The reason for it is the males engage in a lot more fighting and a lot of more defending of territories than the females. The females in general tend to just do their own thing and they don't spend as much time fighting other creatures of the same species. So the males tend to live slightly less than the females. Same in the case of the hippos. A dominant bull will try to hold on to his power and the um, his territory or his pod for as long as possible without allowing or fight or while fighting off any other potential suitors that might try to take over his pod. There's a little one going out. Oh, you had a spool. I thought that you were gonna go out. We just want to see your tiny little legs. That is it. Well, for such a young creature, it's very agile in the water and clearly feels comfortable jumping up and down there. Shame, she's looking up like, oh, please help me. <laughs> it's quite a handful, this youngster. Samantha, I think that hippos um, are fully grown maybe when they're about six to eight years old, depending if it's a male or a female. So it takes, so they'll, they'll be sexually mature before then and they won't be under the care of the mother at that age, but it takes them quite a while to become adults. 
so this little one still has got a very long life ahead of it and a very long time before we can actually call it a, a fully grown hippo either a male or a female I thought it tried getting in on top of the mom's back Maybe it can't reach. It's jumping or bouncing off the bottom and then just trying to get on top of the mom, but it can't. <laughs> Trying a new angle. I think it's definitely trying to convince the mom of something. Something naughty. <laughs> Maybe it just wants to go on its mom's shoulders and the mother won't let it. <laughs> Look, it's definitely trying. It really wants to go on top of the mom's back. <laughs> and the mom's having none of it. It did it! It did it for a second! <laughs> Where did you guys disappear onto? just playing games, just jumping from on top of the mother from one side to the next. <laughs> it's actually very adorable. Yes! You did it! Yay! At long last! I wonder why it's keeping the nose in, in the... The mom's just like, no, I said no, I will not carry you. <gasps> but why? <laughs> Let's see if she stands back up just to make it slip down again. Oh, okay, she's been carrying it the whole day and she just doesn't feel like it anymore. <laughs> Are you gonna try again? Maybe it needs to come running. Two youngsters at the back are back at it, like fully grown hippos with big tusks. to choose where to watch because as the ones are fighting in the back then the little one is just like almost like doing hoops and loops to get some top of the mother <laughs> that's very funny like a dolphin there just trying to stick its head out of the water it's almost like they've got the zoomies now they're going into the crazy hour you know that that I don't know if parents call it suicide hour but it's that hour before you know when they get hyperactive just before they have to have dinner or go to sleep or something like that and then they just go a little bit crazy they start running around and doing all sorts of things what a handful
This is that one, I don't know if you've seen, that guys make so out of the leaves. My sweetie, what a Friday, Langali Moni. BirdLife South Africa, our country's only dedicated bird conservation organization. They have been very successful in a number of areas, including the conservation of more than 150,000 hectares of grasslands and estuary habitat, saving thousands of albatrosses in trawl and longline fishing, and training community bird guides as ambassadors for nature in rural areas. Celebrating their official 25th anniversary, they are sharing 25 of their top success stories across their social media platforms. BirdLife South Africa is currently striving towards the conservation of 132 bird species that are heading for extinction. If we conserve birds, we will protect other biodiversity and important habitats that provide clean water and clean air for humans. Their work is forever ongoing. People who love birds can become a member of BirdLife South Africa or make a donation towards a bird conservation project. Guys, just watch what's happening. See, watch the elephant, watch the lions. See, the first ones to run are the cubs. Can you see them? They are right here. I'm not sure how scared you were, but I was quite nervous. <laughs> Absolutely incredible. Expect the unexpected here on Wild Earth daily. It's a pan that I often forget about. It was very close to the Mowati as well, which makes it quite accessible for animals. But if you look, there's quite a film of algae. And algae blooms for lots of reasons, probably lots of nutrients in there from animals defecating. Elephants, rhinos, hyenas, put pumps sort of extra nutrients into the water and it's very stagnant. Other than the rains last night, there's sort of no inflow, no outflow, it's just a really stagnant water body. And once the oxygen gets removed, well, it looks like this. I'm just going to sit for a moment or two as there's some wonderful suns around us right now. Lovely to just stop for a moment. We've done a lot of driving. It was nice just to take a break. For our rumble in the jungle, the battle royale ended rather abruptly with the two original hosts disappearing with the interloper. 
So we decided to move on from the domestic dispute. Very interesting. Okay, pop. It's going to be plenty of them this morning. I hope you're ready for creepy crawlies. This is a zebra millipede. And I think you'll understand quite easily why it's called that. Hi, everyone. My name is Mike Anderson. Behind the camera is Craig. And we are here once again at Eco Training's Pride Lands Conservancy, where after a very heavy rainstorm last night and lots of thunder, it was an awesome display of nature's firepower. It was consistently powerful for about an hour, which was incredible. And that kind of rainstorm and this nice, warm, humid weather is what is bringing all these insects out. Now they realize that summer has started the wet, the rain, lots of soft food, soft dead vegetation. So this millipede that we see here, very, very defensive, but I think it will uncurl itself soon. Here we go. It's just starting to very slowly uncurl. This millipede is a herbivore. And in fact, most, most often, termed a detritivore, feeding on dead plant material. So especially after the rain here, the dead plant material is nice and soft. Oh, look at it. Here it uncurls. Beautiful colors. So it curls up like that to defend its very sensitive legs. So it's got hundreds of legs. I think it's probably got hundreds of legs. Oh, look at that. Straight as it uncurls, straight onto a nice, soft impala dung pellet. Had a little nibble. No, that one was not tasty. Just gonna keep moving. Look at those beautiful colors. So it curls up to protect its legs from damage from predators, which is assumed we were. And now as it moves, it has other types of defense as well. It can, it can actually secrete toxic substance. Oh, look, it's defecating. That's interesting. Look at the back of its body just opens this um, very mechanical looking flap and then drops a tiny little pellet. That's interesting, I've never seen that before. So they can, can secrete a toxic substance from between the segments on their body, which is one defense. It can also turn upside down and move very much like a snake. And I think I've heard that called swearing. I mean, by doing that, by turning upside down and moving like a snake, a small predator might be surprised and think, oh, it's not what I thought it was. Or it's even possible that it could shake off any small insect predators like assassin bugs by doing that. Perhaps give itself just a few moments to escape towards a thick bundle of grass like this one is doing now. Oh, touched something that did not like. The ferret, that is easy to find out. I'd actually, I've never measured my hands before, but this one is about as long as from the end of my index finger to the corner of my thumb. So that long, that is how long this millipede is. So what is that, maybe 15 centimeters? No, a little bit, yeah, around about 15 centimeters, maybe, maybe a bit less. Very, very nerve, nervous millipede, though. It's probably the first day that it's gone out since the last season. I don't think they live particularly long, but this one is quite large. I think it's probably more than one, one season old. And so it's very cautious about how it moves. You can see it's, see that? It, we weren't even anywhere near it, and it just touched something that it didn't recognize or didn't like, and it immediately curled up into a ball to protect itself. It's amazing how quick that is. There are many things that feed on this, from you know assassin bugs, like I mentioned, that will pierce through the, the segments on its body with these little stabbing mouth parts, to things like civets. Civet, civets will also consume millipedes, actually lots of them. They seem unaffected by the toxins in the millipede's body, those cyanide base secretions that I spoke about earlier that they can secrete from between the segments. And I've also heard hornbills use these millipedes. They collect them and they actually disturb them and press them all around their nests. And they secrete this toxin, which then uh, gets rid of any parasites from the nesting sites that the hornbills like to use. That's quite clever. You ever heard of, of, a, of a, a bird using an insect repellent? I don't think it's very pleasant for the millipede, unfortunately. I think it possibly even dies in the process, but nature is nature. 
and that is incredible. I don't know if this is also in Gwazi Heart and Gingarika again, the same four from yesterday, which is fascinating. Look at the tails. Look at all the tails. <laughs> what are they doing? <laughs> I truly wanted to see some of the Juma plants out. Yes. I haven't had a good look. It's definitely corks, definitely gingarica. She's also got a fair bit of blood on her. Okay. Corks has got that tail up. Let's just... Mm, no, we're gonna stay here. This is fascinating, everyone. I'm just watching. These are the sightings that you need to be able to understand what's going on. Hey everyone, my name is JP. I'm one of your Wild Earth Eco Training Bushwalk guides. So, for many years, you've been watching Wild Earth directly from your laptop or computer. However, now you can watch it directly from your connected TV, your Apple TV, or from your Roco box. And if you are like me, always busy, you can now download the Wild Earth app and view it directly from your mobile phone. For those of you who love to join us on safari here on Wild Earth, we have some news. This is incredibly exciting. The team have trawled through the archives and found the very best of Safari Live from over the years. Come and disperse the with locations such as the Masai Mara in Kenya. You can see how close he is from where I am. Swalu in the Kalahari. It is absolutely incredible. And of course, Pinda and Gala, right here on our doorstep. Listen. We have hours of great entertainment that is now playing on our channel. Catch up with guides from the past and of course your favorite animal characters. It's happening, I've never seen this before. The best of Safari Live will be broadcast on Wild Earth Channel daily. So jump on board and join us down memory lane. Times for this brand new series are on our website. Guys, have a look at what we've got. This is better than my birthday. Look at that. This is the first time that I ever see cubs this small. Th this is so special. This has officially just become my best sighting of all times. Tune into Wild Earth every single day. It's in your nature. The bushwalk feed allows the camera person some creative license. This is my favorite style of shooting. You have to be mentally and physically prepared. You're shooting handheld in some very strange and contorted positions, always with a straight back, often in the squat position, low to the ground. The creativity comes down to the relationship and sync you have with your presenter. The more you understand each other, the more you'll be able to tell the story seamlessly. And we're just at Twin Dams, the twin of Twin Dams.
there could be an intruder around, but an intruder hyena. Okay, I'm gonna run around because I want to know what's going on. I know you're listening to the audio, but they're talking to you, Julie. This is incredible. This is the sighting we've been waiting for. What is going on with the Juma clan? anything going on? Have they had an altercation with other hyenas? <laughs> now we're at Twin Dams. We're very, very close to... the den. Not in a rush. Okay, copy. Sitting by the dam, watching all the impala acting nervous, the birds calling, the birds trying to shake off the rain. It's quite an awesome thing to do when the rain stops because you're not getting wet. So we're just going to take this moment to just sit and listen to all the sounds around the dam. definitely looks chilly. Well, that's pretty cool. There's a Janet that's been watching Shasha all along, just on top there of that other really thin marula tree. Well, that's quite unusual. 
The last sighting I had of a genet and a, and a leopard was actually Tristan and I went to Londolosi not long ago, maybe about a month ago. And we found we, with the guide that was doing the transfer for us, like a really cool guide called Kirsten, we saw this genet on top of a very thin branch of a tree and we're like, no, there's no reason why a genet would be up there for no reason. And then we started scanning and at the bottom of the tree, then we saw hidden in the rocks was a leopard cub. And then the genet was on the top of the tree, there was a kill on the tree and then the leopard at the bottom. It was quite something. So I wonder what has actually happened. I don't know if there's a hole in that tree and that's where the genet's been coming out from because it seems to be pretty perched in there. Let me just switch this radio off a little bit. But it's a very cool sighting. Oh, what an extra surprise. I don't think this Janet knows what to do. Oh, little Janet, how did you get yourself up there? They, uh, Janets can be active during the day, but they're mainly animals that are crepuscular or nocturnal. They move around in lower light conditions, and that's when we tend to see a lot of them. But they can, as we know, they can move sometimes during the day, and today is a pretty dark day. I mean, it's been strange weather, so perhaps it was busy out and about looking for food, and then, I don't know, maybe he bumped into Shasha, and he was like, nope went up the tree to try and stay away from it. It seems like an older genet as well. Almost looks like a little bit of a Yoda because it's, it's got a broken ear. <laughs> oh, you poor genet. <laughs> How stressful it must be to be you. <laughs> Yeah, no, I agree with you. The sighting keeps getting better and better. It's unbelievable that <laughs> this is one of the best views of a genet that I've had in a very long time. Although I must say, I had a very cool sighting with Darren on my previous stint of Shasha actually hunting a genet. So I don't know if there's if there's a theme here, if this leopard likes eating genets. Maybe he chased that genet up a tree before he got the impala. I mean, there are a couple of possibilities. Because this is, yeah, like I said, this is the second time that I've seen Shasha close to a genet or, well, we don't know if they were involved. The genet definitely knows that the leopard is here, but I don't think Shasha knows that the genet is there. Or if he does know, doesn't seem particularly faced by his presence or anything like it. He's not even looking in that direction. Yeah, Chacha is still there, but I don't want to sound like a spoiled brat, but we get to see way more leopards than what we get to see genets like this out in the open, which is pretty cool. I don't, like I said, I, don't, I thought maybe there was a hole in there where the genet is, but I don't know if it had some sort of altercation with Shasha and that, that's why it went up the tree, or if maybe it was moving around here and then saw that Shasha was around and then just decided to go up the tree just to stay away. It obviously knows that there is a leopard there, and it's just looking very alert and it's looking past us. We're not blocking the view or anything and Josh is still by the by the base of the termite mound just chilling down there. He's looking very hot and then <laughs> I think this is a large spotted genet because it's got a tip of a black tail. We get two similar species here, one slightly larger than the other one. The small spotted genet and then the large spotted genet. So the only reason we could actually see it is because we saw the tail hanging and, you know, as we picked up binoculars, Aubrey turned around and Aubrey's one of the guys at Truman, he was like, did you, did you see the genet? <laughs> We're like, oh goodness, it is. So they are quite arboreal creatures. They do live in holes or they can go into holes in the trees and that's where they spend the night or when they go and rest and then they spend the day there as well. But we don't really see them this well. It's not a common sight at all.
it's more common during the night when you go around with the spotlight and then you see them but it's actually a very special sighting what we're witnessing now like I said, probably an older individual. It seems like it's missing a half, a, half an ear. Or, well, not missing, but it's been split. So I wonder if it's run to Shasha before or ran into Shasha before. Maybe it's just looking to go down there. It is facing the bottom part, so I don't know. Maybe he I'm wants to go down there. Oh, let me just turn the radio down a little bit. Pretty epic. What a good sighting. Hey. Oh, that's so cool. And then the fact that it's so chilled and Shosh is still, he's still resting. So I think, I know we want to see the leopard, but let's see what the genet does because the leopard will very likely just move back to the kill. I want to see if maybe the genet will go further up or if it will actually just come down and then run somewhere else. And then, of course, if it comes down, we're not going to follow it. Um, I don't think... Uh, It'll be a very small creature to follow out in the bush. It'll likely run into another tree, and we won't be able to see it. Also, we don't want to. We don't want to get in the way if there's a little genet running away from a potential predator such as a, such as a leopard. I don't think Shasha would be interested in the genet, though. Not today. Maybe not another day that he's hungry. But today he's got a big kill there that he doesn't need to worry about. Oh. Nothing beats sitting around a campfire at night whilst on safari, listening to the calls of the wild and chatting to your guide. If you sign up to be a wild earth explorer, then you can enjoy this from the comfort of your home. Imagine hearing bush stories from your favorite wild earth guide and reliving their highs and lows of a life spent in the wild. Every month, Wild Earth Explorers will be treated to an exclusive fireside chat, special occasions, hot topics and deep dives into the Wild Earth characters. Everything else is just welling up inside of you out of nature. You know, some people think I'm weird, but I have an absolute jaw. I have a good time. Now, I enjoyed myself thoroughly today. Wild Earth Explorers, it's in your nature. It has been a wonderful privilege to identify one of our key characters here at Penguin Beach, Pepper, with a very, very distinct facial patterning, as the name would suggest, very peppered and speckled belly. I'm really looking forward to seeing what this penguin does over the next few days and months. Because of those unique markings, it's going to be really, really cool to watch it as it moves around the penguin colony here at Stony Point. This warthog is in big trouble. He's got elephants all around. What are you gonna do there, big guy? What are you gonna do? Oh, he's pretty brave though. Oh man, he's not even moving. Look, that elephant is trying his best, but that warthog ain't budging. That's madness, that's so funny. And we have a winner. The warthog wins the standoff. Expect the unexpected here on Wild Earth, daily. Funniest question I've been asked. Oh, there have been so many. Uh, you can almost do a little anecdote book just on guest questions. Uh, sort of been asked, do you know which trees do elephants roost in? That's a tough question to answer with a straight face. Someone asked me if a windsock was for feeding giraffes. <laughs> for you and it's adorable um yeah sorry about that little bit of delay there was some rain and vehicle issues etc etc so shame what we've actually done is i've swapped with lauren she's now in wendy and i'm in rusty so we are heading back to where we left the wild dogs hopefully they are still on the cut line i don't think I mean, the sun was out just a little bit earlier. Um, he's 
heating up a little bit, but now it's quite cloudy again. But hopefully they've already hunted this morning and they're just gonna settle down on the cut line. Good spot for them to settle, you know. They'd be able to see far and really just sleep rather well. So we should be able to start seeing them in the next minute or so as we jump onto the cut line. They are about a kilometer away from the turn off when we left them. But let's keep our fingers crossed that they are still in the same spot. This road is also deceivingly long. from the left and um, they were coming south so hopefully they went into Juma if they did move a lot of rain that's just dripping down on me quite badly okay so we're gonna keep checking hopefully find some doggies but for now i'll send you over to lauren well we're back out again and to be honest i've given rowan rusty we've been swapping to make it fair um, to make it fair for the cameraman, to make it fair for everybody. But Rowan's had a tricky stint. I wouldn't say it's been the most joyous stint with the weather, the tech problems in the car. So I want him to go and see the dogs that he was with earlier. And Wendy ain't gonna get there. So Wendy's now on quarantine, she's off, and I'm more than happy to just sit here, look for insects. We've got some water buck, the most beautiful bums in the bush. But I do want to continue with the whip scorpion spider because we got cut off. Oh, the rain rudely, rudely interrupted us. So I've switched him over. And you know, when I first arrived here, I would never ever touch this thing. I was terrified. But oh, and let's try and get as close as possible into the detail of the face. That's the one. We were doing anatomy and I can't really remember where we got to be honest, but eight legs, six, legs at the back are just normal legs for walking like we walk and the long two these two crazy long ones here we can just have a look they look ridiculous actually they are for sensing so they have a special function they can walk on them but they're for sensing and they're called antennae form so they're not antenna but the word antennae form is giving you a sort of real indication there that they're using it in a sensory world. Now, if we go to these ridiculous things here that look like scorpions, that's where the sort of name comes from, they're very enlarged spiny pincers. You can see that's what it's using to grab things. And these are called pedipalps, and they're using it to catch prey. Now, if you just look, 
here, right here. My porky puncture is on the other vehicle. We did a quick switch. You see those two black dots? That's the eyes. Two tiny little eyes. And then there are actually three on either side. But you can... Okay, I will come back to this for now. Over to Rowan. Okay, so we managed to find the dogs. They, actually, majority of them have moved into Juma. The one we were focused on now looks like it either had a broken leg or a big cyst. And then there in the you distance, you can see yeah. a hyena bumbling along, coming in this direction, of course, just to come check whether they got lucky with... Maybe there's a carcass here or something. <laughs> I love the way they bounce down the road. But yeah, this, that dog turning off now. Shame. The leg, the back left leg doesn't really look that good. Of course, natural injury, you know, so there's nothing we can do about it. If it was a snare or something, then of course, they get involved. Now the hyena's left the road. Ah, it's back on. And then we've still got just the one dog on the left. The rest of them seems to be settling in longer grass. But I'm actually quite excited to see what happens when the hyena arrives. I mean, there's no food here. By the looks of it, all of them had full bellies, so they did hunt this morning. Huh. They took the turn off. This is wonderful. So yeah, Hamilton pack, 26 of them. See one of the, that's the one with the bad leg. And now he spotted the hyena. So you can see both ears up, looking in that direction. It sounded so. <laughs> Yeah, I think a little bit itchy with the wet grass, a few ticks. I find it quite strange that they chose to lie down in the wet. Luckily, again, it's a cooler sort of day, so there's still a little bit of activity. Okay, now he knows about 100 meters. See how it stops, just to check out the scene first. Be very careful with approaching. But wild dogs wouldn't kill it, but they will bite the bum and the tail and puncture the skin. <laughs> Again, what a cool scene. Johnny again, I mean, <laughs> every injury is different. If it was just a cut on the leg, it'd be fine. They'll be able to lick it clean. The bacteria in the saliva will sort it out. This injury is never going to recover. That, um, that leg's going to be like that for the rest of its life. So, I'd, I mean, it's a little bit far to see. I don't know if it was an old break or like a big cyst on the leg, but yeah, I can tell you now, it's not, it's not limping terribly, but it's definitely limping. So it will be slower than the rest of the pack, but they would still let it eat. I mean, wild dogs are wonderful. This, this society, there's really a lot of care between them. 
you don't see them fighting over carcasses. They don't bite each other. They all just feed simulta uh, simultaneously and, yeah, just get along. Of course, it's vital for them. Being pack animals, they need that relationship so that they can hunt together. As you can imagine, 26 of these are... Oh, it's an impala's worst, worst, worst nightmare. Oddly enough, I mean, of course, they're not ambush predators at all. They just, they usually start walking, and there are no areas, so a clearing or something like that, um, in an area. And they'll go into that area checking for impalas or anything, any prey species. And then when they do see it, they just run. And you'll never hear Impala's actually alarm call at wild dogs. There's no time. Hear the lion? So always a good idea to, when you're sitting with animals, even though I'm talking, just to watch their behavior. So when the lion started roaring, both of them lifted their heads, looked in that direction. And now they know, okay, it's quite far. Not real bother to them. That might actually be on Juma. Close to Gari Cutline. And then <laughs> further north of us on Buffalsook, there's another lion responding. Headlands, so yeah, they do. But so do lions. Um, I mean, <laughs> so, yeah. That's another thing. I mean, they were seen to be cruel because they start ripping it apart. But then in about, I don't think an impala will even last a minute with 26 dogs. So it's very quick. I've sat with lions killing a buffalo for an hour and 20 minutes, suffocating it. I mean, there was a horrendous, or I mean, amazing, but quite hard to, difficult to watch video that came out about two male lions eating a hippo. And the guide there said they watched the entire thing and they sat there for three hours and when they left, the hippo was still alive and they were feeding on it. So it's not only wild dogs that eat live prey. Go ahead. Uh, good morning. Uh, may we please um, a response to that last place if there are no other station responding? Yeah, copy. Make your way. Still static on Buffalo Cut Line and Tamboti Road Junction. Fantastic. Um, just to let you know, we're driving a, a group there, so there'll be a few vehicles. Okay, perfect. We are the only vehicle. Okay, so someone's going to come join us. And then I'll actually chat to Lauren, see where she is. Uh, she's got Wendy running. Okay, we'll look for lines later. to start off. Bright colors and it attracts the insect to the flower, which is exactly what we're watching right now. This is so exciting. Good. Hi. Hi. It is 
smallest baby black black jackal I have seen in the wild. Look how full the belly is. <laughs> it is so incredible to spend this time so close to an African penguin. They just make me feel alive. That is incredibly sweet. Grooming each other. Play is vital. This is how they learn. This is how they would tackle prey. There you go, there you go. There you go, there you go. Heart is pumping right now. Look at this, everybody. Is that a live kill? There's nowhere to go. It's just such an incredible privilege to be out here. It just keeps on delivering. There she goes, going for the youngster. She got it. That's what I'm talking about. Look at that. This is insanely good footage. So yeah, we're still sitting in exactly the same spot. She's trying to figure out basically where the rest of them are. We've got a marula tree just to our right, and I actually think a few of them would be underneath the marula and underneath the weeping wattle, but then quite a few of them actually went a little bit further in as well. So yeah, it's quite tough to see, especially in the long grass. And then the hyena, you can imagine, is just sleeping not too far off, waiting. He'll patiently wait till this afternoon, or a little bit later maybe even, because it's not the hottest day. Maybe they feel like hunting earlier, go for a bit of a run, and the hyena will just try to keep up, try to scavenge whatever is left. Stacy, so what will actually happen? I mean, it is a, it's an injured wild dog with a bit of a limp, so this wild dog can still keep up. So yeah, I don't think you need to worry too much about this guy. He'll be a little bit slower, but still very fast. So they won't just leave it behind. I remember quite a couple of years ago, we were watching another pack and one of the youngsters also had an injury. And the other youngsters were kind of bullying it. It's like a weak link. Of course, that makes it tough as well if there's a weak link in the pack. These dogs, when they do wake up, literally all you can see are ears. They actually start lifting their head. This one's just having a scratch. Oh, might have tapeworms. A characteristic white tip on the tail. So each single dog would have a unique pattern, and it's quite nice to see with with this pack. Of course, 26 of them, it's, oh, it's a massive pack. Um, but yeah, they some are light, some are darker. That one still looks like a youngster. Usually born around you know, mid-May, June sort of time. Oh, Gabby wants one as a pet, so I'm just rolling a little bit forward to see if we can actually check. <laughs> no, 
that is still hidden. Oh, that one is very full. Definitely had a good meal this morning. Gabby, I, uh, to be honest, I don't think it would make a very good pet. Of course, they pack animals, and so you'll have to qu keep quite a number of them. So now we just have the one with the injury still on the road. It's good for them to spread out like this as well. I mean, you'll have dogs nearly everywhere on the outskirts around um, where the youngsters are. Not too sure if anyone's trying to call me on the radio. Been rather low. See the tail up. Might move off to the right as well. If he does so, we'll go into the longer grass and join the rest and try to find him. <laughs> okay. Actually, should we drive there? Yeah. Looks like they settling there. Nancy, so it does happen, they, they split off um, when they hunt and sometimes lose a pack for a day or so, but they usually find each other. They make this, it's almost like a ghostly um, little howl when looking for each other, when contact calling. Um, but yeah, otherwise, no. There was a, there was a wild dog in, there's a few of them, and then in front of us also quite a few of them, so actually, let's stop here. There was a wild dog, oh, I can't remember whether it was Botswana or um, Zimbabwe, that, I think it was a female, and she was the only one left of the pack, and she actually joined up with Jackal, and formed a pack with the Jackal, and yeah, she's surviving. Apologize, guys, if you hear the radio. I'm just gonna s turn the volume up a little bit, just in case someone else wants to join us. Now that we are further off the cut line, they should still see us from the road. Oh, that's quite nice. Right over the stump. <laughs> I love the little sounds they make. Not really very vocal animals. Often if it's a, I mean, if they spot a predator, any danger to them, it would be a bark, just to let the others know. But they're not like domestic dogs that just keep barking and barking and barking. They're fairly quiet. And then when they start rallying, like getting excited for the hunt. It's almost like bird chirping. Okay, so we'll reposition, see if we can frame up a few more. And while we do so, send you back across to Lauren. looking around for insects. To be honest, it's still very wet and cold, but it's not gonna be the best views in the world. But oh, and just down here, we have a juvenile shongololo, the best word ever to describe insects. Mm. Okay, there we go. Have you got any sort of view here? Yeah. Okay, I'll move out the way then. And this is a juvenile, it's small, it's not even black yet. It's still sort of really, really pale underneath, dark on top. But it is a shongololo, a millipede, but that's just what they call them in South Africa, and it's such an epic word. I mean, why would you want to ever call it anything else? Still got views? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> 
We probably will have to get towed back to camp, but that's okay. I'm quite happy, and I'm super happy that Rowan got to see the wild dogs. Really, I have been here a long time. He's got a shorter stint and he needs to make the most of it. But apparently the anti-poaching guy that we know quite well that helps us out whenever we see him saw Tlalamba last night, right where Davi and I were checking. <laughs> but I think it was later on at night, so I think she's been sort of on patrol and I wonder if she's gonna go back to the den or went back to the den. So this afternoon, hopefully I'll be on Rusty. Maybe even Wendy will be fixed and we can get looking for Tlalamba because that's the important thing. I'm just going to slowly walk back to the car so that I can see what you guys are seeing. There we go. Oh, where is it? Dead center. Disappeared. Uh, it's in the middle of the bush, right? Okay, and even on this bush alone, if the Shongololos disappeared, I've been looking at the wall theorias. Everywhere I look at the wall theorias because that's where you get the flower mantises and I really want to see a flower crab spider. But here, another arachnid. It's not a whip scorpion spider, everyone. But this here, Owen, I'll try and keep it as still as possible. Another rhino tick, they're everywhere. Literally everywhere, just waiting for rhinos. This is a female. So if any of you were watching the other day, you would see that I showed you the male. The male has got a black exoskeleton, but it's covered in big, fancy, bright red dots. Whereas the female is actually not so fancy. She's kind of more black with just a little bit orangey red. But she's clinging on for dear life. She's quest, well, she's not actually questing. She's clinging on to the stalk of grass. I'm gonna let it go, Owen. And what she's hoping will happen, if we can just go a bit wider, is that a big rhino, white rhino, you know we get them here, it's not a secret. The white rhino is gonna walk past and brush. The tick's gonna be able to smell the rhino, chemical, not necessarily just by smell, like, oh, it smells like a rhino, it's gonna be able to analyze the chemical scent. And as the rhino brushes past this vegetation, the tick uses its forearms, just like the whoop scorpion spider. The forearms, the ones right at the very front of the strongest, gonna latch on and boom, that's it, it's found its host. Is a rhino gonna walk this path? Who knows, we do have quite a few rhinos here, but who knows that it's actually gonna walk right this path and right past this blade of grass. But this is what this rhino tick is waiting for. But the reason it's so tightly curled up right now is because it's not really warm enough. It's been raining, the weather's not being nice. But just rhino ticks are just everywhere right now. It's really, really fascinating. Now, Owen, I don't know how, if this is gonna work for you, but if you just look here, can you see this? There are about 10 little eggs. I'm just going to have a quick look myself. I don't think they've hatched yet, actually. I don't know what they are. I don't know what they are the eggs of. It could be butterfly, could be moth. Not a praying mantis, not a cockroach, because they lay uthikas. Here we just have eggs. Could be anything, because a lot of people wonder where do insects lay their eggs on the vegetation. Now these are quite exposed. I mean, I can see them from really far away. Normally, you'll find that a lot of butterflies and moths try to lay on the underside of the leaf. The leaf that's not exposed to rain, yes, may get wet, but on the underside for protection and for well to hide no one will see them but i don't know what eggs they could be if any of you guys know let me know hashtag wild earth but i mean the, the sun is not even up and it's just taken me to come to this thicket there's lots of different vegetation here and just have a look just stand have a look i find a tick juvenile shongololo eggs oh here we go there's another one you're another female We've got two females on adjacent stalks of grass. Wow. I didn't catch that name, but to be honest, I've never had a tick bite. These guys are not gonna latch on to us, honestly. I'm not a rhino, I don't even smell like a rhino. I hope I don't smell like a rhino. I don't, there's not gonna be any moment where this tick lands. Oh, fly just lay on, landed on my hand. Oh, can you believe that? Oh my goodness, now I now have to. I just put out my hand and it landed on my hand. Is there anything you want? Do you want to be on camera? I think Owen's putting you on if you got him. Yeah. It's just your average fly. I mean, I know a lot of people don't like flies because of what they land on. Flies are also utterly fascinating. I'll tell you about them a bit later. 
I use my hands a lot. I grew up sign with sign language, British sign language, so I'm just really used to using my hands a lot, and I literally just put my hand out and a fly lay on my hand. I wonder if I can get them closer. <laughs> I am going to come back to your tick question. <laughs> He's toasting. Okay, wait, wait, wait. I'm bringing him to the camera. I'm gonna get some close-ups. Oh. Do you dream of traveling to a far-flung wilderness location where life continues as normal? A place where you can escape to nature and breathe. If you become a wild earth explorer, then this could soon become a reality. Subscribe today and stand a chance to win regular travel prizes. Wild Earth Explorers, it's in your nature. This is incredible. <laughs> Looks like vivid monkeys do sometimes go for swims. And I heard something splash, but we couldn't see what it was in the long grass. Now I just saw that thing swimming there. This is incredible. I hope it gets to the bank. There are crocodiles in this dam. And it looks like, you see that monkey climb up into the tree? Wow. Expect the unexpected here on Wild Earth daily. Hi, I'm Mike Anderson, and I come to you live every day from Eco Training Pridelands Conservancy in South Africa. The wild animal I think is most underrated, I think buffaloes are the most underrated. They're so, t so tenacious and ferocious, and also very, very protective of each other, which I find incredible. You know, sometimes people think of the big five, they just think of lions and leopards and other big animals. But I think buffaloes are pretty underrated. Catch up with the guides daily here on Wild Earth. I love being a cam up for Wild Earth. The animals coming right up close to you, especially like lions. Sometimes you get nervous, but you have to go with the flow. <laughs> My favorite animal to film is the elephant because of how big it is. But when it's really up close to you, it's one animal that you would say, I really respect you. And so this is the second most endangered predator in Africa. You know, there's, I think, there should be around 400 to 450 of them left in the whole of Kruger. And we are just surrounded by 26 of them. Beautiful wild dogs. Stinky, but gorgeous. Actually, for us, it's quite a inviting smile. I quite like the smile because it makes us, you get excited. You know, if you have the smell of wild dogs in an area, you know this is going to be fun. And it's always amazing to spend time with them. Yes, they'll most likely sleep for the rest of the day till this afternoon. But even that, I mean, they'll sleep for a while, get up, shift a bit, especially in the long grass like this, you could just see that ears twitching, tails wagging. There's so many flies and things bothering them that eventually they'll get a little bit uncomfortable with a spot and just try to shift to a more comfortable spot. and all of them full-bellied. So I wonder, there's no chance that they only had one impala. I'd love to know what they ate this morning. And of course, that I don't think anyone saw it. 
luckily for them, there's quite a few African weeping wattles around, and it seems like I keep looking behind me every now and then, so one dog would get up and move and then lie down again. It seems like all of them are drawn towards the shade of these weeping wattles. A number of flies have definitely started to pick up. I've actually got a few on me as well. Amy wants to know how many pups do wild dogs have at a time. So Amy, what I've noticed is first time mothers, it would usually be a smaller litter. Um, Give an example of a pack I knew quite well. And when they split off from the original pack, she only gave birth to four pups. The next year she gave birth to 10 pups. The year after that it was 15. Um, I think the largest amount, the largest litter I've ever seen was 16. No, sorry, 17. And, oh, that was quite funny. I mean, we used to, drive behind the alpha female. She gave birth on the 18th of May. So I think the last time we actually saw them before they were denning was the 8th of May, something like that. And ew, I remember driving behind them and just quite terrified that she would sneeze because I was convinced a puppy was just gonna pop out. And actually just kept our distance because of that. She had a very, very, very big belly. Of course, she'll give birth in a termite mound, so quite safe for them. All the puppies will stay in the termite mound, and yeah, that's always a nice thing to have on a property because you always know the dogs are gonna be there. So call that their den site. And they'll go, same thing, hunt mornings, hunt afternoon usually in different directions, but um, yeah, you just always knew you could go back there. And of course the adults will come back after hunting and then regurgitate for the mom at first, or then later on should leave babysitters. So then regurgitate for the babysitters and then the pups as well. Come back full belly, and the puppies come begging out, and the adults all have to regurgitate their food for them. Wouldn't you just love to be a wild dog and eat vomit for the first few months of your life? <laughs> Not ideal. and the puppies get excited. They get super, super, super excited, the pups, when the adults arrive back, and they'll literally just mob. Mob the adult, whichever one's gonna regurgitate food for them, and oh, it is a beautiful sight. I'm very sleepy. The one's got his head up now, further in. Maybe getting a little bit comfortable or uncomfortable with the spot because of the flies. Okay, so Lauren's made her way to a termite mine. It's actually quite a nice spot because you'll be able to see a bit like Ribbon's Den, be the same thing as a wild dog's den. <laughs> Too many flies here. This is all the dogs are making their way out now. Yeah, so we'll send you over to Lauren, who's at the termite one. just admiring the view, but I'd really like to finish my discussion on the whip scorpion spider. Um, 
Um, because we never really get to see them. I don't think I've ever, I think I've spoke about them live once. And I've also came a long way for many of you guys who know me. Even Owen, actually, back in the day, I've worked with Owen for how many years now? This would never happen. Family portrait. Ever. Now, okay, it's dead. But I've came a long way, a very, very long way. And sorry, Owen. I know they're creepy, but just while we've got this exoskeleton, I keep getting interrupted. Let's just wrap up because these guys are actually amazing. Now, they do have eight eyes, two in the front that Owen was showing you earlier, right up the top here, and then six, three on either side, which I can't actually see right now. But despite eight eyes, they actually themselves really can see very well. And that just shows you that they've evolved in such a way that they use other senses. They've got these sensory legs and they've got all sorts of sensory hairs everywhere. So they're living in a whole different sensory world. And believe it or not, they're actually kind of touchy-feely themselves. They... The research actually showed that the mothers of various different species caress their babies with their feelers, feelers being those two long legs at the front. They touch, they touch, they caress, they stimulate. They're obviously communicating on some level, but it's all down to being very, very touchy. They also witnessed in this sort of amazing study that these organisms, whip scorpion spiders that are neither a scorpion or a spider, like to be in groups. They like, they're very, very social. They like to be in groups until they reach sexual maturity. And social behavior within arachnids is very unusual. You do get the community nest spiders, but generally speaking, it's very unusual. I think that's pretty impressive. And going back to the Harry Potter idea when that spider came out tap dancing, they like to dance. Sort of last resort. They do like to dance. I've got no comms. Did you get that one? I'll uh, just ask you guys to repeat that if that's okay. But anyway, this study states that only 27% of the time is actually a violent fight. Apparently the feet dropped. I don't quite know where I was at. So once FC let me know where they lost me, I'll repeat what I was saying. When I introduced the spider, I was talking about the Harry Potter theme, and the spider came out dancing, tap dancing. And really, that does have an origin, because the two spiders, whip scorpion spiders, will avoid fighting. They normally do something, what they call a dance, and it's probably an arachnid version of lateral presentation, to be honest, lateral presentation in mammals. But they also do this. Now, of course, they have weapons. Look at these guys. Look right here. Yuck! My goodness, weapons, they can hurt one another, but only 27% of the time will it resort to violence. So just a quarter, three quarters of the time they normally just dance and one retreats. They'll probe each other with their whips. Now these things here, the feelers, can be used as whips. If you, if you look at the, the legs that they actually use for walking, look at the difference. So this is not essentially really a leg, this is an adaptation of antennae. And that's why it's called antennae form, because it's not actually an antennae, but it's an adaption of that, a sensory appendage. And they can actually lasso them, woo, 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 round and round like a whip. And that's where the name whip scorpion spider comes from, if that makes sense. It comes from this. And I actually said they can walk with them. They actually can. They place them on the ground as they're walking. You see it bends, but they're using the six legs for walking. 
So it's a highly, highly specialized adaptation. I think that was wrong comms, FC. So just highly, highly unique animals, really, really fascinating. And their legs also respond to vibrations. And I've recently got interested in the fact that a lot of animals are in touch with the frequency of the earth, human, something that humans are not. And through these small little legs and sensory hairs, they can actually detect vibrations on the ground. And I was mentioning hyenas the other day, elephants definitely do, but I think a lot more organisms do. They're way more grounded, quite literally, than we are. And just to wrap up on this guy, in South America, they're huge. This one's actually not that huge. Terrifying, yes but really not that huge and they will not harm humans in south america my goodness they will be the size of both of my hands like let me tell you but i just thought i would share this with you because i just want to bring a bit of positive light to them they are scary looking and a lot of people fear them i'm just going to give you one view of the underside and then we shall wrap up on my little friend here look you see that you see the legs are all coming from the same muscular body component not the same as insect do have an abdomen and then you have a cephalothorax so it's not quite the same as a thorax but just really really unique design and i think i'm going to keep this little guy i'll give you some views again because the sun is coming out it's been a very confusing day and what i learned is davi and i got rained on i had to change my clothes i'm wearing a completely different shirt from what i started on we got soaked owen and rowan did it so they were thinking, why is Lauren and Davi come back to camp? We got soaked. Davi and I both have to change. But anyway, you can see the dark clouds there. There's a bit of blue sky. But really, the day just keeps on getting more and more strange at this side. I will try and find some more insects for you. Nancy, you're saying the weather was really unpredictable and that's the delight of safari, I know. If you were actually on a safari, you would probably stay out and just get wet. But naturally, we've got very fickle, fragile technology um, <laughs> that we really have to look after. But it just it's just unbelievable that it rained so heavy on quarantine, albeit not for very long. And in Owen and Rowan, Team Extreme were on both as a cut line and got a few drops. It's amazing. I also saw that nice bodied old dog. Oh, and I think that kingfisher just caught something. I hope you can see it because of the roof. It literally just swooped down in front of us and caught an insect. I'm just not sure where you're gonna get it. Oh, it's flown away again. It's amazing to watch them catch insects. Oh, he's over there. I think he's got something in his mouth. And unfortunately, Rowan has my binos. But anyway, we're gonna sit here because we literally can't move and we'll see what else we can find. If I could take you on safari all day and all night, I would. But unfortunately, it's not always the best time to see the animals. Now, in between safaris, you can watch the Wild Earth Channel with loads of extra shows. If you have a connected television, Apple TV or Roku box, then download the Wild Earth app. And if not, then just find it on the App Store on your phone. Cape Nature is the chief custodian of the Western Cape of South Africa's natural environment. This highly successful organization strives to conserve the province's natural heritage to ensure a sustainable future. Besides nurturing nature, Cape Nature offers an authentic ecotourism experience to local and international visitors. And one of these experiences is walking amongst the penguins at Stony Point, or as we know it, Penguin Beach. Wild Earth broadcasts live from here every day 
and is very privileged to be partnered with Cape Nature who have focused their conservation efforts here. If you want to visit these iconic black and white African penguins for yourself, then head over to our website to find out more. Cape Nature. Conserve. Explore. Experience. Our bodies are made up of about 60% water, which means that in a very short space of time, you can dehydrate completely. A relatively efficient way of collecting water early in the morning is to take an absorbent material like a sock and to walk through the grass absorbing the condensed dewdrops on the grass. Once the material is saturated, you can then squeeze it out into a container or you can suck it out directly into your mouth. My name is Lauren and I'm currently working in Juma Private Game Reserve here in South Africa. I love answering your questions during the live safaris. It's my favorite part. It feels like you're on the vehicle with me and I'm able to teach you exactly what you want to know. If you want to ask a question on Wilds Earth, then you need to register on our website. Once registered, you must go to the live safari page and ask your question below the live feed. Okay, so majority of them are actually started to walk. I think the alpha female's in front. She's now breaking into a trot. And it seems like they're almost going back to the boundary again now. There's a bit of a dip here, um, like a slight drainage line. But what we'll do is we'll just stick to the tail end of the pack, which is bizarre. You know, it's, all of them are still full bellied. I think she just aside, no, too many flies here, too many parasites being bitten, it's itchy. Let's leave. Of course, they'd prefer shade um, over just lying down in the hot, hot, hot road. actually start following now. I think I've counted 25. Mind you, I might have missed one. Ah, 26. Here we go. I wonder if it might just be easier for us. Actually, let's keep an eye on them. It does look like they're heading back towards the boundary though. But they're on the fire break, which is good news for us. Dolly, I'm not going to put a three that in much. It makes both of us very wet. Just hold on. <laughs> Definitely not our best road. Luckily, it's not so wet that we'll actually slip and slide around. A number of them just quickly settled to our left. Some are deeper inside. Mm, it's a marshy, wet patch there that they have to go through. So maybe she just decided, okay, let's go for a drink. Darby, I'm going to take us a little bit further forward. to see them through the long grass, but you'd be able to hear them, see the ears, so cool in a marshland.
actually hear them just planting around in the water. So I don't really feel like driving in there because we will 100% get stuck. So I was talking a little bit earlier about them hunting, so of course they hunt in a pack, but what they would do is they would see a herd of impala and all just dart at them. So this could be 60 kilometers an hour that they run trying to catch impalas and so it's not like 26 of them are going to go for one impala. And this is what makes them so successful is they'll actually split up. So three would follow an impala here, four would go for one there, maybe 10 would follow another one. And it could be that all three of those hunting parties are successful. It should then be a bonus. And I think that might have happened this morning because 26 dogs are all fully fed. I don't quite keep quiet for a little while. It's just nice to watch and listen to them playing. So it seems it's mostly the It's just such a cool thing to watch and listen to. When on safari, there is nothing better than an evening spent under the stars chatting around a fire with the sounds of the wild all around you. If you sign up to be a Wild Earth Explorer, you can build your own memories by joining our guides for regular fireside chats. Subscription payments can be made by PayPal, credit card, and now bank transfer. Wild Earth Explorers, it's in your nature. Wildlife trafficking remains a growing problem in South Africa, and often made worse by the way the media portray this complex issue. The Wildlife and Environment Society of South Africa, WESA, have recently embarked on a program whereby they train reporters to better tell stories of wildlife trafficking. In my community, wildlife conservation is mostly something other people do, and I would like to change that. My name is Iman Singli. I told people I met that the pangolin is one of the most trafficked animals on the planet. But what is a pangolin, they said. Why is it in danger? This is what made me decide that the pangolin story must be told. If we are to play a part in preventing the extinction of this animal, then we must all be part of the battle. A partnership between WWF South Africa and WESA, supported by USAID. <laughs> Oh, 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 what are you doing? Are you trying out for the ballet? <laughs> now it's an itchy bottom. Up we get. Mom's coming. Everybody's moving off. I am an outdoor photographer, a wildlife filmmaker, and a conservation storyteller. 
Penguin Beach is going to offer us this really unique opportunity to watch and pick up on the smallest of details in the penguins lives. It's going to allow us the time to really get to know these penguins well, get to know their story and get to interpret the little finer details and share that with you with a live TV show and get you to fall in love with penguins. It's getting cold again. I really do think we're in store for rain. More rain. It's gonna be hard to find insects when it's chilly and they're not really solar powered enough. Is that the kingfisher, Owen? The kingfisher's doing a really good job at finding insects. We are not. At least I had two dead ones for you. And I will continue to bring dead insects that I find in, on the vehicle. I don't know what happens to them, but because camp, well, our camp has light. I think a lot of them are attracted to light. There's a lot of nests for things that have grown over the years. Camp is a really, really good place for insects. We're just finding them and bringing them onto the vehicle. It gives us a good sort of insight into their anatomy that we wouldn't get if they were alive. So you can really see, are the kingfishers up there with something in his mouth on? But I don't know. Can you get it? <laughs> We've got the rain roof on, and when we have the rain roof on, my... Uh, on it is up... Yeah, yeah, I think he got it on this branch. See it? <laughs> it caught something. Oh, it's, what have you got there? Is it a beetle? It's big. My goodness. Wow. Are you going to be able to swallow that hole, Mr. Kingfisher? Oh. It's amazing. He's trying to break it down, soften it, ensure that it's dead, make it a little bit more palatable, but mm, doesn't look too yummy to me. Okay, I'm gonna see if Wendy turns on. She might, she might not, who knows? But you guys are gonna head over to Rowan. All the best. So, majority of these dogs have actually stopped playing now. And, <laughs> no, never mind. Going again. But I think they are starting to make their way for the east now. The lucky thing is here, yeah, because they're in marshland, you can actually hear where they are walking. It's just visually very tough to keep up with them. But they are heading straight further into Juma. <sighs> Yeah, so that might have been us with the wild dogs. But what we might do is this afternoon, check where they ended up and try find them again. Good. Probably a good chance that they'll go towards quarantine. That would be a bit of fun. Right outside of camp. Oh, definitely not our best road. But lovely to have you guys. Glad we got out and got to show you a few dogs. Really hope we we'll see you again this afternoon. Have a beautiful day. Bye now.